Hi everyone, I'm Anissa and this is Royal FM's Side Chat with Artists. In this show, we talk about everything and anything art, crypto, and the NFT scene with the designers and creators alike, otherwise known as non-fungible tokens. My guest is Sarah Zucker, aka The Sarah Show. Sarah is an American in analog video techniques and is the author of the short film comedy series Super during Panic Attack and Mutations, a more lexicon and has a unique insight into creating storytelling art use of views. Please enjoy. Hi Sarah, thank you so much. To start, I'd love to hear a little bit about your how you first got into crypto and FT art space. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing well. Can you hear me okay? I hear you perfectly. Okay, cool. You're you're cutting out just a little bit for me. I think I heard what you asked, so I'll Oh no um yeah, so I got into crypto art um, in April of 2019, which it's it's kind of weird that that's, you know, in the grand scheme of the world, not that long ago. But, um, you know, with, with so many people getting into it now, it's sort of funny to be like the wizened, one of the wizened elders of this space, um, you know, something I've been doing for like two years. But, um, yeah, I got in uh, because... Um, you know, for me, I actually had been sort of waiting for crypto art to emerge. Obviously, I didn't know that's what it would be called. Um, but I know when Ethereum first hit the scene, you know, around 2015, there was a lot of discussion or or some discussion in some of the sort of like new media arts um, channels and, and feeds I was following of people saying, you know, this new blockchain technology is going to make it possible for artists you know, digital artists to edition their work. And um, I've been doing digital art for, I would say about 10 years at this point. So that was very exciting to me. Um, at that time, I was primarily what I would call like a GIF artist and a net artist, um, as well as someone obviously who has a very robust uh, video art approach. So I sort of thought, wow, this is really cool. You know, um, in my in my earlier iteration as an artist, I was a photographer and uh, worked for a time as a curator in the mm -hmm. fine art photography space. So uh, for me, especially, you know, I, I knew a fair amount about provenance, about editioning, about these things that make fine art saleable and collectible. And I, I sort of around 2015 went, aha, this is it. This is this is the thing that's going to allow us to create that same concept of scarcity and provenance for digital artworks. So, you know, I'd had my little feelers out for several years. And then um, it was an artist actually who had shown in a, I, I used to do an audio visual, like a visual music series that I curated here in Los Angeles called Prism Pipe that ran from 2014 to 2016. And through curating that show, I mean, I was introduced to so many incredible artists around the world. You know, I would do these big open calls and I would also just, you know, uh, seek people out, you know, uh, on Instagram and, and elsewhere um, for these shows. And it was an artist I showed uh, named Yura Miron, who, or Miron, who I, I showed, you know, a couple times in the series that I did. And, you know, years later, as these things will happen, you know, these these iterations, these eras of your life, like a lot of these artists that I showed at Prism Pipe back in the day, I continued I continue to follow to this day. And I started to see him posting, oh, hey, you know, this GIF I made, it's for sale on Super Rare. And I was like, what, 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 what now? What? Excuse me? How do you mean? And. And I, you know, clicked the link and checked it out. And it was like that aha moment of, oh, my God, this is it. This is the thing that I have been waiting for, that finally someone has created this container and created this technology to allow us to edition digital artwork. And so, yeah, so I applied for Super Rare, uh, I think, right around that time. I probably applied at, at in like March of 2019. And then, uh, you know, at that time, it was not... Uh, uh, not not to not to you know mm -hmm. uh, self deprecate I, i'm sure i i earned my spot in there but you know it was not quite the uh hot ticket item that it is now you know it was still very early days for super rare and mm -hmm. so yeah i got in there and i i minted my first token on the blockchain on april 4th 2019 wow 
Yeah. yeah I, mean, I mean, I mean, speaking about your past, right? I, I read that mm -hmm. you also, you know, you and your partner kind of founded and developed a creative studio uh, together called Yo Meryl. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to, you know, kind of hear about your past and how you first got into art. So like, I'd love to hear a little bit more about Yo Meryl and actually how the name came to be. <laughs> sure. Sure. Uh, yeah, I'll start with Yo Merrill. It's uh, you, my my wife uh, Bronwyn Lundberg is also a crypto artist. Um, she's also on Super Rare and some of the other platforms. I, I highly recommend everyone check her out. Um, we founded Yo Merrill uh, out of necessity in 2014. We just, you know, uh, Bronwyn went to school for animation and video, and um, and so she's, you know, was always sort of an animator. I'm really more of a video person. I, I wouldn't really define my art as animation necessarily, um, though I use elements of that. And um, we just, we had this opportunity that came up in 2014 to create uh, a series of gifts for the Brooklyn Museum, which is like crazy. That's, that's, it's, I think rare that that's how that happens for people that like their first gig is something so huge and so visible. Um, but it just, it was just through, she had created an, an artwork that had gone viral in 20, uh, 2012 called The Lesbian Last Supper. And when mm. I say viral, I mean truly viral. Like it, it was on, you know, the Rachel Maddow show and, and like it was on, it eventually ended up being, you know, it, it features um, Ellen DeGeneres as, as Jesus, which, you know, for some people it's very offensive to them, but I think it's all in, yeah, uh, it's, it's not meant to be offensive. It's just meant mm. to be a bit of fun. Um, but anyway, so she had gained a lot of visibility through that. And uh, that that's, you know, in a roundabout way, how this Brooklyn Museum gig came to came to be, you know, that that she had developed this name for herself doing um, celebrity portraiture and and caricature. And so, uh, you know, in, in Yo Merrill, I really am in the role of of writer and, and sort of director. Um, my background academically is in screenwriting. I, I got a master's degree in screenwriting. Um, from NYU in 2010. So, you know, that's this whole other side of me that I think people who collect my work and are really familiar with my work probably can see that, that you know, I often say my my true specialty as an artist is like vision and voice. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily the person you go to for like things that are the most technically um, mm -mm. advanced, you know, all the techniques I've learned really are in service of these ideas I have. I'm an idea yeah. person. So, mm. uh, so in our partnership, that's, that's really the role I'm in. I'm, I'm the idea generator. And then she is this like incredible animator who can bring these ideas to life. So, so yeah, so we, we, we wanted to, to partner up on this, this project and it was the first of its kind It's the first time a major art institution, uh, commissioned and displayed GIF art. In, uh, so this was in 2014 and and the name Yo Merrill actually came from our first date together that we were <laughs> we were walking around West Hollywood and um, and sort of like talking about Meryl Streep because I had actually as a as a freshman in college had had a run in with Meryl Streep that was very embarrassing no. for me. And uh, it's a whole other tangent that <laughs> I'll go into <laughs> some other time. But but we basically were talking about her and then we got really paranoid of like, you know, it's it's Los Angeles. It was like, oh, my God, she could be around any corner. She could she could be hearing us right now. And then we were just sort of giggling like, yo, Meryl, yo, you know, like, yo, where are you? And it's, it, we were, it's funny, we were talking about this yesterday, actually, because, you know, uh -huh. you know Meryl's still going strong. We have we have some really cool things in the works right mm -hmm. now. And um, we were talking about how that, you know, that name that we came up with in 2014 really, really, I think, perfectly, uh, perfectly encapsulates our aesthetic and our whole thing. You know, mm -hmm. that there's the elegance and the fabulousness of Meryl Streep with the sort of like 90s Nickelodeon, like, hey, yo, you know, like, mm -hmm. like yikes pencils and like neon colors, um, you know, and it's it's really those two things, those two elements that have like coalesced in our aesthetic that I think is why, you know, as you said, we ended up doing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, content for Super Deluxe, um, which mm -hmm. some, some people may be familiar with it. It's no longer around, but for a time it was sort of this incredible playground for artists and, and weirdos. And um, so we did a lot of cartoons for them. And I think that's that that merging of of, you know, concepts and, and feelings is, is what has made people really hook into our work. 
Um, but yeah, so that's Yo Merrill. And again, we're still going strong. Yeah. We've minted several pieces together as Yo Merrill. In mm. fact, uh, we had a piece uh, that was a short called Glitch Slapped that, uh, you know, I want to say it feels like 100 years ago, but I think I minted it back in like March of 2020. And as far as I can tell, and I've had others sort of corroborate this to us, you know, and I, I'm always hesitant to lay claim to something if it's like, I, I obviously don't want to say it if it's not true. But as far as I can tell, like, it's the first narrative short film that was ever uh, minted on the blockchain, you know. Wow. And how I define narrative short film, right, is that it had full sound production. It was, it, it had a story. It had a, you know, it's not just a GIF. It's not just a you know, l single visual idea that it, it had its own little narrative to it. Um, yeah. So short though it may be, it um, we I, I think we were we're very happy to sort of claim that as as uh, mm -hmm. the, one of our firsts. Um, but yeah, so that's not even to speak to my whole how I <laughs> how yeah. I reached this place and how I got started with all this. Um, I don't know if you want me to, to go into all that. Yeah, I, I mean, like, you know, I read about, like, you know, your your exhibition in the Brooklyn Museum, which is huge. And I yeah. knew that you guys drew celebrities interacting with, like, crabs and bicycles. <laughs> and then uh -huh. you guys also started a project named Shows That Weren't, which uh -huh. I loved, by the way. Thank you. And then you guys had this thing called Rat King. Yes. And it was, like, <laughs> where, like, there was booze and it would, like, fuse the rat tails together. And I was like, yeah. how do these guys come, like, how do we come up with stories like this? Like, this is insane. I like I wouldn't have this in my like in my dreams, you know. Like it is not vivid. So so yeah. so so it was just crazy to me. Um, yeah. but um, yeah, I just love to know, like you know, when you come up with these stories, mm -hmm. and I know that you know, like um, you know, would you call yourself a storyteller? And so you know, when you come up with these stories, is there a storyboard or what really goes on behind the scenes? So, you know, from the sounds, the ideas, the character design, what goes on? What goes on in you know in there? Sure. Um. Yeah, I mean, storyteller is obvious would would totally be an appropriate term mm -hmm. for what I am. I don't know that it's a term I often use, um, right. but it, absolutely, it it works. It it mm -hmm. defines kind of, especially when I'm working with her, the role that I play. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when when we're working together as Yo Merrill, yeah, there's definitely storyboarding happening. Um, and in the case of uh, you know shows that weren't, which was again one of our series for Super Deluxe. I mm -hmm. think I wrote, I mean, I, I like I said, I have a background in screenwriting. So I, I often, uh, when it's like a more full-fledged animation like that, I, I write a script, you know, and right. screenwriting is very is a very particular medium in that, you know, part of the writing, an equal equally important to the dialogue is, is you know, you write what is seen on screen. Right. So, um, so that's, you know, it's why I think, again, I would say people who are, are familiar with my own work would, would see, would see how that's, uh, very much a medium I'm very well versed in. And I, I actually teach mm. or in the past have taught screenwriting online, um, mm. because it's, it's a passion of mine and it's something I'm, it's a form I'm very, um, that, that just really, I have a lot of like symbiosis with, it just feels very natural mm. to me. I, as a as a kid i always wrote my diary as like a dialogue right like i that's just me wow. you know it's that it, i would often i would write a dialogue between sarah one and sarah two you know i'd have these like conversations with myself as my diary like mm. which so it's no surprise you know i ended up studying dramatic writing um because it's very mm. different than prose you know mm -hmm. and um yeah so i hope that that answers that of how we sort of go about that and and again like we're you know we're working on something longer form right now and it's full it's just like any any you know any show or any project that would be out there where it's right it has a script it has a whole it's a whole process that goes into it um at least in terms of that partnership mm -hmm. yeah and and you know like in this space i've noticed uh, a few like artists you know comments as like a director or a storyteller like mm -hmm. in addition to like you know being an artist mm -hmm. so you know in your opinion, what are the telltale signs that you're a good storyteller? And does it always mean that you need to have something to say? And do some people have more things to say than others? Oh, wow. That's quite a question. <laughs> um, I mean, <laughs> I certainly, I would not be the arbiter of what stories are worth telling. I think that's a very, right. <laughs> I think that's a dangerous game to play. You know, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, the reality is everyone has a story to tell. I mean, that really yeah. is the truth. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of, you know, like I said, I've I've worked as a screenwriting professor, so 
<laughs> I, you know, whether or not people have that um, capability to learn the technique, you know, it's like right. anything. Like, it's like myself, like, I like to paint, but I, I don't paint professionally because it's it's not a gift that I have much uh, fluency with, you know, and, and, and storytelling or writing is the exact same thing, right? It's it's a craft, you know, that's they always say, like playwrights are called playwrights, like the way that's spelled W-R-I-G-H-T. It's not right like writing. It's it's right like uh, to make something rot, you know, like rot iron, mm. like there's this, right. you know, to tell a story, it really is a, is a craft and you have to learn, you have to learn how to do it. Um, so I guess that would be my answer to that is every, everyone has a story to tell. Again, mm -hmm. I, I think for myself personally, it's just something I've, I've always been aware of and known that I, I have the gift of gab. I love to, to weave a yarn. And, um, mm -hmm. and so then I, you know, spent my education learning how to do that in a more structured way and in a way that would allow me to, instead of just ramble incoherently, <laughs> that would allow me to, you know, really get, um, make, make, make a work that is satisfying to people that has right. a beginning, a middle and an end, you know, and that's, that would be my suggestion to anyone within any, really in any, in any craft is like, learn, your, learn your craft, you know, um, because, because so much of the things we, we think are, wow, I can't do that. I don't have that gift. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, there's definitely an aspect of some people have a gift for some things, but most of it is just discipline and hard work. Um, so, mm -hmm. so don't be afraid to like, you know, be bad at it until you're not like, that's everything, right? right? You have to be bad at it until you're not, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you think creativity can be learned or do you think it's more innate? Like it's more nature? I, I absolutely think that creativity is something every, every, every person has in them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit of column A, column B, right? Like what I'm saying mm -hmm. is that I think absolutely some people just come into this world, you know, Mozart was composing virtuoso, virtuosic piano compositions mm -hmm. by the time he was three years old. You know, there are definitely mm -hmm. instances of that. There are definitely instances of what we'd call savants, right? Right. And, and any of us, you know, even if we were not on a Mozart level, any of us might have certain things that we were just given a little, we just came into this world with a little extra. But mm. I think that too often the average person in this world convinces themselves that they aren't creative. I hear that all the time as an artist. Mm. I have so many people in my life or just that I encounter who are like, wow, I could never do what you do. I'm not, I'm mm -hmm. not creative at all. And I always, right. my answer to that is like, oh no, you are. What you're really mm -hmm. saying is you don't see the value in fostering your creativity. And mm -hmm. that's about, that's from our society more than it's from, mm -hmm. you know, that's not any individual person. That's that our society undervalues the arts. Uh, right. You know, in capitalism, we have a really hard time seeing how the arts make money, which obviously is mm -hmm. one of my favorite outcomes of crypto art is we're really flipping that narrative mm -hmm. on, on its ear. And mm -hmm. um, and and so I think that creativity is something that every human alive should make space for themselves to be creative. I think it's also when people say, oh, I'm not creative at all. What they really mean is when I try to be creative, I assess that the outcome is not good. And, yeah. and they may be right. You know what I mean? I'm, that's what I'm saying is they're not necessarily wrong, you know, like um, in terms of on the grand scheme of good and bad or, or how people perceive it. Yeah. Maybe what they're creating isn't something they could go out and sell. Uh, and again, right. that's so much in our society. We dictate whether it's good or bad versus would someone be willing to pay for it or not? But mm -hmm. I think that that completely that completely like ignores the fact that creativity is nourishing right like right. creativity just like eating food is it's nourishing for the soul it's nourishing for the mm. mind um so it's i'm i'm a huge proponent of the fact that i think every person alive would be well served just like i think every person alive would be well served to try yoga like i'm i love yoga i'm a huge mm -hmm. yoga person and for many many years of my life i was such a like in my head type of person who had mm -hmm. like physical education trauma from my childhood that I was like, no, I'll never do that. I don't want to, I'm not good at being physical. I'm not, I'm not coordinated. I don't want to do it. And it mm -hmm. was really like a health crisis that made me have to take up yoga. And I'm so, so, yeah. so grateful I did. And now, you know, five years later, I'm, 
I still wouldn't say I'm good at yoga, but I'm very practiced at it and I'm very disciplined about it and I take great joy from it. But I would never like try to be a yoga teacher and I would never try to like, I will never start Sarah's yoga Instagram account where I show everyone my yoga because that's not my calling. I, I, I was correct in my assessment that it's not what I am called to do. It is not the thing I have a great natural gift for. But mm -hmm. I also am so, so, so enriched by by mm -hmm. making space for it in my life. So I feel the same way. The same thing is true of creativity, that all people mm -hmm. are would benefit from making space for creativity in their life. No, 100 percent. I, I think, you know, before it was like there's always been creatives in the space, but people keep trying to capitalize off it. Um, mm -hmm. And then so the creatives just go elsewhere and then they, they make another place creative and the same thing happens. So it's interesting, you know, with crypto and NFTs, how that paradigm is shifting and people are accepting it. And it, it's a yeah. great community. It is. It really is. It's yeah. a mutating community, <laughs> especially oh, sure. as of late. <laughs> it's, it's crazy to me. Like when I, you know, I have so many people in my life that yeah. truly have always just when I've tried to talk about crypto art since I've been in it for two years, mm -hmm. you know, where they're just like, I have n Sarah's talking about one of her Sarah things. I do not know what mm -hmm. she is on about. Mm -hmm. And now it's like you have Mark Cuban talking about NFTs and you yeah. know Elon Musk and all these people. Mm -hmm. And it's so it's starting to reach mainstream understanding. And as part of yeah. that, you know, every day I truly feel I, every single day I wake up and I'm like, well, this is a completely different community than it was yesterday. Yeah. I wonder what I wonder what today holds, you know, and it's exactly. exciting, but it can also be a little um, my nervous system has been a little freaked out lately. I can't, yeah. I, I can't lie. Like it's it's been a, I call it happy stress. You know, it's like happy the stress. same. The same way I felt uh, when I got married, like the, the day of my wedding, when someone asked me how I felt, I was like um, traumatized, but in a good way. Like, <laughs> like, like I didn't right. sleep for like a week after because it was like so mm -hmm. much happy, positive energy being shot mm -hmm. at me by all these people I cared about. Right. And it was like, wow, I've never experienced anything like that. Right. That's such a singular mm -hmm. moment in your life. And that's like that thing where I was like, I'm. this is the same as trauma, right? Like the, my mm -hmm. nervous system, my fight or flight is so activated, yeah. um, but but because of something positive. And it like, really, mm -hmm. truly, this past month in crypto art yeah. has been making me feel the same way where it's like <laughs> that feeling of if I blink, I'm going to miss something. That feeling of like every single day, my DMs are full of people mm -hmm. asking me questions, asking for, th mm -hmm. and, and it's great. I love it. I mean, I'm in this space because I care about it. So it's, it's, that's what I mean by it's all good. It's all positive, but right. just on a base, like human level, <laughs> I'm also mm -hmm. like, I'm having to meditate a little extra lately and like right. sleep a little extra. Cause I'm just like, yeah. oh my God, crypto art is yeah. like blowing up and I am yeah. very, very sensitive. <laughs> so I'm blowing up with it. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy, especially with this digital age. Like people aren't meant to be like, you know, consuming so much digital content or so much right. information at once right. that, you know, it's overwhelm all the senses. It's I mean it's I you know, I I it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, speaking about like, you know, like the art that you put in, like I know that you put in a lot of humor into your art, which uh -huh. I find fabulous because I love, love humorous art and there is enough of it and we need more. Um but, you know, I, I noticed in one of the interviews that you said, you said that, you know, there's a fine line finding the line. You know, mm -hmm. you only know the line after you've crossed it. So <laughs> how do you feel against it? What is acceptable? What is funny? And because sometimes if you cross a line, it stops being funny. And sometimes it just becomes transgressive. Sure. So then, so then like, you know, how would you kind of find the line? And have you ever crossed that line with art? Yeah. Yeah. I think that you're talking about the the there was a little documentary about about yeah, my yeah. wife and I, our, our practice. And, and we were talking mm -hmm. about our super deluxe stuff and how, mm -hmm. um, you know, how with that, with those cartoons for us, that was kind of the game of it. Right. That was a space right. where everyone was being w as weird as they could be. And yeah. so it was kind of the game of like, how much can we push it? And, um, yeah. and, you know, what's interesting about that, like in terms of finding the line, you know, I, since I joined the crypto art space, you know, right. I, I came to this space with such a vast body of work already, you know, because mm -hmm. I have just always been someone who creates from my youngest right. days. I just make things. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, so when I joined up with crypto art, I already had this vast body of work. And this is this is a question I see a lot of people joining crypto art 
uh, mm -hmm. asking themselves, and I see a lot of artists in crypto art making big, you know, grandiose statements. You know, some people really think you should only create new work for this space. And right. if that's how they feel, good on them. You know, I think I think that's a very valid viewpoint. But I also think there are artists coming into this space who have these incredible pieces they created a year or two ago that have their own value, you know, and like because they've never existed as tokens, why not? So yeah. I, I'm definitely someone who who straddles the line in terms of, um, you know, I have I have a token up right now on Super Rare that is actually the auction is ending today. If anyone's mm -hmm. interested in checking it out, um, called Video Ornatia Forever and Ever, and that's a series. This Video Ornatia series I've been doing that's been ongoing since like 2015, and this particular token I created in 2018, and you know the artwork itself, and I try to be very cognizant of um i try to primarily post new work right. and uh but but i have certain pieces i've selected from my archive where i think this needs to this needs to be tokenized this is right. this is a really special piece of mine and it's back in when it originally emerged and originally debuted it was you know very um celebrated or traveled a lot or whatever it is or just i think personally i just really like it um, I know I'm getting off topic a little bit, but I, I, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm going somewhere with this, I promise. Um, so it's all to say that, like, in terms of creating new work, right, like, especially since joining this space, there's always that, I think every artist has to deal with that allure of you see something, if it incorporates a Bitcoin or if it incorporates an Ethereum, yeah. it sells for, like, 10 times more, right? Yeah, the symbols. And, and I think that you know, I, I often, it's something I've been saying a lot lately, and I know some people might not like this, but this is just my truth. I'm an artist first and a crypto person second, right? I've become very knowledgeable about crypto and I've become very, um, I was talking yesterday about aping into something and my wife was looking at me. She was like, what are you, what are you, what is this word aping in? Mm -hmm. And I realized I was like, oh, I'm using crypto terminology. I'm using DeFi terminology without realizing, oh, right. That's people who aren't, these are, there are certain code words that are in the space that right. indicate like, you know, this is just how we talk. This is the language of the space. So it's all to say, I've obviously become very knowledgeable about the space and learned a lot. But for me, it's always going to be art first and crypto second, personally. And, and that's very helpful in terms of, again, finding the line. And it's not exactly about humor. In this case, it's about everyone has to come up with their own code of ethics for this space because that thing we were talking about, right? Of how it's like, it's a very activating space. You can find yourself getting really like manic, really frenzied because every second there's some new exciting thing and you see yeah. someone doing something and you're like, oh, I wish I had done that. And you know, this idea of aping in, oh, I want to ape into that project or this project. Mm -hmm. And I think you're really well served um, early on to just check early on and repeatedly throughout check in with yourself and go wait but who am i you know am i for, am i doing this because i want to make a gazillion dollars well the reality for me is i would not have chosen a life in the arts if it was about money for me i would have chosen a different career path you know what i mean mm -hmm. and i think that that is true of of probably m most of the artists in this space like they no, none of us chose to become artists because we wanted to be gazillionaires right like obviously we like to afford our lives that's and that's kind of new that this space is making that possible but um mm -hmm. but really it's like think about that it's like you would have gone into finance if you wanted to be a finance this fact that we now have this financial component to art is amazing, but um, it's just to say, and I'm and I'm certainly not critiquing. I think there's incredible work out there that is about crypto, that is about Ethereum, that is about Bitcoin. I, I'm not criticizing that. I'm saying for me personally, uh, as I create new work for the space, there's always this dance I'm doing of, you know, I'm a very intuitive creator. Like I like to think of my creation almost as channeling, like which is sort of like a mystical term, this idea of the the art channels through me. And so inevitably, as I'm more and more immersed in the space, the things that come through respond to the space, right? Yeah. And I think that's very um I think that's appropriate, right? I think there's nothing crude or crass about responding to this space that we're moving in, especially as it's as it's becoming so 
uh, impactful, so profound. You know, at the beginning, we were all selling our work for like 40 bucks a pop. And like mm-hmm. now, obviously, that's that's like you can't get you can't get NFTs for that price anymore. Um, it's v- sounds very quaint to say. So it's just it's just to say like. And then in terms of humor, right, this is, <laughs> I sure did tap dance my way around to back, back to your original question, that that the space of crypto art has a very, very, very different set of um, just cultural standards and cultural perspectives that inform their humor right there's this obviously it's so internet native it's so crypto native and crypto specific um my perception is of course it's it's predominantly male um i'm you know as a as a female bodied individual like navigate just to be a woman on the internet like i don't need to tell you it's 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 its own thing it's like i always try to you know when these discussions come up i try to just sort of point out to to men who maybe who just literally you have to give them the fact that they just don't know that it's like Mm -hmm. listen everything I do I'm doing and then I also have to do the work of being a woman on top of it and I'm not asking for special treatment I'm not asking for like I I really personally don't like tokenism I don't want to be the token woman you know because you needed to check some box and make sure you had a woman on your list but I also am like just think about what it's like that like I'm just this artist making this cool, weird art and it's its own thing. And it, it, you know, it's my gender in many ways is irrelevant to it. But, um, but then to be a woman on the internet, people expect different things of you as a woman. You are expected to do a lot more emotional labor. You're expected to like answer more questions for people and be more understanding. Just be, you're expected to be everyone's like mom and sister and girlfriend who hears about all their stuff. And you're like a bitch if you, if you are like, I don't have time or if you just don't do it, you know, not to mention just the like, God forbid, if you have, you know, a face that exists and you might get people like creeping on you. Again, I digress, but it's to say that like, I'm just, I'm pragmatic, right? So I've assessed this space. It's very male. It's very, you know, it it is so different in terms of what it finds funny compared to other spaces I've moved in. Um, yeah. So finding the line, it's like, I think you just have to give yourself permission to, I, as I always say, the only way you find the line is by crossing the line. Um, mm. And that's really the permission I've given myself with everything I'm doing in crypto art, right? Is like right. from the get go, I gave myself permission to say this space is so brand spanking new that there aren't standards here yet. There aren't like in any other space we enter, right? Just social spaces, school, work, whatever it is, you're entering into that with thousands of years of human experience that dictate to you. This is how you act when you're at work. This is how you Mm -hmm. act when you're at school. Well, when, when myself and some of my peers from the earlier days entered crypto art, there was no that. There was mm-hmm. no standard of this is what you do in crypto art. So the reason that now people entering have these ideas like Genesis token. Oh, well, my Genesis token's worth more. Or, you know, oh, this is how I run an auction. Like the way we run an auction is all because Coldy in made up how to run an auction, you know? <laughs> like yeah. there's all these <laughs> things that, um, you know, all these standards that exist now. And it's because of those of us that were that have been doing this for a little while making mistakes and figuring out well that didn't work you know and and I really like I'm a big um you know I try to be transparent about that with people of like uh, pricing has been a big one for me like Mm -hmm. for me I my work is truly unlike anyone else's and I don't say that uh to brag in fact in many ways I'm saying that because just to point out to my collectors or to fellow artists who look to me, you know, if you make 3D, a certain type of iridescent 3D art, you can look at the space, see 10 other artists who make work that's similar to yours, see how they price it, and you can follow that model and be quite successful. For right. someone like myself, even still, you know, I am seeing, I am starting to see people who work a little bit in some of the tropes that I work in and a little bit of like, you know, what I mean by that is like, uh, CRT TVs or VHS look or glitch or whatever it whatever you want to call it um, but mm-hmm. even still like 
I, you know, I always say it's the witch, not the wand. And my work, it's like that. By that, I mean it's not about the tools I use. It's about it's about the person who's using the tools, which is me. Right. <laughs> and um, so, in my case, it's been this ongoing adventure. Even still, I'm I'm coming up on my two year crypto art anniversary, and even still, I. Because, like I said, because every morning I wake up and the space is different, I still am sort of like, I'm always doing this crash course on learning more about finance, learning more about investing, learning more about the the piece of things that is not my wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. And and because I make mistakes, I price things incorrectly, or I, I accept too little when I should have held out for more, or whatever it is, and then I'll get feedback from my collectors, or I'll get feedback, you know, from people... Who who very whose opinion I very much um, trust, and I'll be right. and they'll be like, yeah, I don't know that you did that right, and I'm like, oh shit, mm-hmm. okay, I didn't do that right. Well, uh-huh. I'm gonna take a note of that, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna let that. It's like you have to. This space is so full of ego. It's very easy mm-hmm. to let your ego become you know King Kong and take over the city. So you have to kind of mm-hmm. go, okay, ego. I'm going to tuck you back because you are not helping me right now. I don't, you're a little bruised over whatever it was. And really I need to be pragmatic and take, take that feedback that I'm getting from the space or take, you know, take it when I make a mistake and try to view it as crossing that line or making that mistake. That is a learning moment that it's all for nothing. If you don't learn from it, you know, if you just spend the time going, Oh, I'm embarrassed or, Oh, I'm mad that, my thing wasn't received better or whatever it is you miss the opportunity to learn from it and do better the next time um so i know that that was a lot <laughs> i hope that no, that sort of answers your question well. <laughs> no, no it's amazing it's amazing to like see you like you know with the topic to topic it's amazing on pricing you know even on the ego thing with artists and like how to tuck that back like it's a lot of things that like a lot of you know artists don't really cover or even yeah. just in talks like it's not really spoken about but it's it's real yeah. You know, a lot of these things are real. And, and you yeah, know, I think, you know, yeah. yeah. It's just that I think like, this like, space yeah. is funny that it, it, we, you know, we see these people who, who really are making the big numbers and the space rewards right. ego, it rewards bravado, it rewards all these things. Yeah. But again, this kind of relates to what I was saying earlier of we don't reward the same um, traits in women that we reward yeah. in men. I find that. Um, that you have to be, uh, you have to just be conscious of like who you are and how you move through the space. And I have found that, um, I, you know, I believe sort of not to use like a cheesy term, but like radical vulnerability in a way, like partly just cause it helps me live, you know, it helps me to feel like I can be a little more honest and that I can be a little Mm -hmm. more that people know where they stand with me, that, that I'm not just like bullshitting them and that I'm not just like, you know, puffing my chest out and saying, Oh, I'm the best of all time. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I am confident in the fact that, like I said, my work is singular and I know that for some people they love it. And I know for other people they don't get it and that's fine. And that's no hard feelings about that. Um, I don't, it's that, I think true, true confidence comes from being willing to admit that you are vulnerable and that you do, that you do make mistakes sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I agree with that. And, you know, speaking about like, you know, like the traditions and things like that, about like, you know, what we're supposed to do or not supposed to do in the interview that you did with Sam and super mm-hmm. I noticed that you guys spoke about art school trauma and, you know, <laughs> coming from a person that didn't go to art school and stuff like that, I had no idea what that meant. And like, I love to kind of get into that because I feel like maybe it's something important to talk about as well. And like people can relate to. Sure. Well, yeah, the context of that, that was my super rare spotlight with Sam J. Yeah. Um, and they asked me about just my journey. Right. And like, and that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier that I, you know, have been into art, visual art since I was a child, but I had this teacher when I was 10 who told me that art made on a computer is not real art. And she wouldn't let me use the computer for this like project we had to do. And I was, I felt so shut down by it that, you know, I went to this strange like arts middle school where we had art, we had majors and I was a visual arts major and I felt so misunderstood and shut down by her that I switched to drama. And that Mm. carried through my entire education all the way through the end of grad school. I never studied art again, you know? Um, And, and yeah, so I was, I was telling Sam that, um, 
that I think that that has actually ended up being one of those choices. It's so weird, this choice I made when I was 10 years old, but that it ended up echoing throughout my life in this way that for me, it actually ended up because I'm someone who I have really high standards, right? Just of art, of of everything. I, it's it's just how I am. I'm very particular. I re- I'm an epicure, so I really like things yeah. to be, mwah, you know, I want things to be the finest they can be. And because I studied right. writing, right? I'm I'm very much like that with my writing. Mm-hmm. I'm very precious. I'm very like demanding of myself that I make it the best it can possibly be objectively you know that uh, I know I, I've taught screenwriting I know the form so well that if I don't you know if I don't live up to my own standards when I'm writing I can be very hard on right. myself and so uh so it's to say that for me with my visual art because I made that choice at 10 to never study it academically <laughs> it just freed me up to just do whatever excited me and then so then as a teenager, I got very into photography uh, and specifically working with film cameras. And I was, you know, rescuing old film cameras. I was hacking them. I was doing double exposures. I was doing all this really experimental stuff and doing stuff that was very, at the time, you know, everyone was getting into digital photography because that's when it right, really right. became very viable. So it was really, for me, it was like, I'm going to go against the grain and I want to just make up exactly what I want to make up. That's always kind of been my thing with art of like, Again, that thing of I don't want to compete with someone who I can just tell some people just have that gift of being able to draw or paint and and like they can draw you and it'll look like a photograph. I know I don't possess that and not just don't possess it. I don't have the patience to learn it either. <laughs> I don't have the patience yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to develop that discipline when I have these mm-hmm. ideas in my head that I need to get out and I, I always have had that feeling of, oh, my God, my brain is going so fast and my hands can't keep up. So I've mm-hmm. always kind of looked for art forms where I can find a way to, like, render the idea the way I can render it. And I'd rather it be unique and not technically correct than have it be mm-hmm. technically correct and boring. That's just my right. feeling for my own art. And so... So it's all to say the reason why I think I've been able to find the success I've found in the crypto art space and just in in digital art in general, you know, that I've been I've been fairly prolific and fairly, you know, everyone knows Beeple for doing the every days. And I did every days for, I'd say, about two years between uh, between like 2016 and and 2018. You know, I really pushed myself to push to to create and post something new every day. and mm-hmm. and which was an incredible experience and i'm glad i'm not doing it anymore because it's you know mm-hmm. it, it's it's a lot um but it really i think is how i was able to galvanize my voice as an artist and my style my look as an artist and um and right. again that's all because in my case not because but i would say the fact that i then i didn't go to art school gave me the gift of right. i didn't have those rigid standards to hold myself against um I know I brought this up when I talked to Sam, but there's this this very famous uh, sort of quote from Ira Glass, um, who is the host of, of uh, This American Life. And he talks about how uh, every every creative person has to be willing to spend 10 years being bad at what they do before they become good at what they do. Right. You know, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, of course, right. but it's it's that of like that thing we were kind of talking about earlier of like everyone has it in them to be creative, but it really is a much rarer person who is willing to endure the ego challenges of being bad at what they've chosen to do, uh, who is willing to do, to be bad at it long enough that they become good at it. right? Right. And that's in any discipline. And, Um, it's, it's all to say that I think the, to speak to what you brought up, the idea of art school trauma, Mm -hmm. and that's actually a term my very dear friend, Edgar Fabian Frias, um, uh, mentioned to me because it's something he and I, they and I have both noticed, um, Mm -hmm. that, um, you know, a lot of people who went to art school, it, it kind of like going to school for the thing you do can beat the love of it out of you because you come in all bright eyed and bushy tailed and like, oh, gee, I'm going to be an artist. And isn't that great? You know, Uh and and then you come in and then you have some mean teacher who's like, except you're terrible, you're horrible, you'll never be any good, you know, and and I think so many people experience that where like then by the time they've gotten through art school, they're so traumatized. It was like, you know, Mm -hmm. being in the trenches of it, having people just lambast them 
by the time they get to the end, they're like, I don't even want to do this anymore, you know, mm. or, or, or they're just, they, they get to the other end. They do try to do it professionally, but then they have all these voices, right? All these mean voices right. in their head. That's the mean, the mean voice of that professor you had who told you, you really just weren't very good at it. And mm. that get, that's your dark passenger, right? Like that's your, right. that's the person or that entity sitting in the passenger seat of your life vehicle whispering right. mean things to you and holding you back and so um it's 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 all to say that I certainly think for many people art school is the right choice like I said for me with my writing I'm so glad I studied it I'm so glad I have uh that I know the form so well because it is a discipline you know you can't just pick up a violin and be good at violin like there are a lot of things where it's like no you really have to like study that to be good at that um, mm. so I'm not, I'm certainly not saying, oh, art school's bad. I just think if you're someone who didn't go to art school, I don't think it's correct to say, well, I'll never be good at art or I'll never be a professional artist. Cause I, I didn't go to art school. You know, it's like, that's bullshit. We all, we all know it's like, you can get a lot from art school, but you can also get yeah. a lot of trauma from art school. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it goes both ways. It's give and take. It's give and take. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, one thing I notice with a lot of artists is that, you know, the way that they think, it's like they, they it's like, you know, seeing a vision, but then it's like tunnel vision. You know, you mm. see at the end of the tunnel, it's this very thin pin. It's just this pin and it's like this line of perfection. Mm. And they're not, and, and a lot of artists, and, you know, they just gather at that the tip of the pin because if everyone was just like, we get we need to get this perfect. I'm not going to stop until it's perfect. It's very narrow mm. because it's like, I need to get this to perfection. And that's what I notice in a lot of artists. And yeah. I, I'm surprised how it hasn't driven people off the walls yet because, the level of like conciseness and you know mm. everyone's like standards is so high for themselves and nobody notices it <laughs> because it's like you know like yeah. it could be like one pixel and nobody notices it but it's so blatantly obvious to them it, yeah. it's insane you know you have to yeah. be a very specific type of person to be able to endure that mm. Yeah, you know? it's, you know, and right. And it's, it that is something that really, I can't make a grand statement for everyone. It really ultimately comes down to taste and there's no accounting mm -hmm. for taste, but I personally find perfection quite boring. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, I would much rather make something that is unique and interesting and technically, in, you know, technically incorrect than make right. something that is technically perfect, but boring. Right. Um, right, right. But again, that's I know a lot of people who, like I said, my art is not for everyone. My viewpoint is not for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. But I also think it's it, like you're saying, I do think uh, in, in this space, maybe a little bit. This is true that um, there can be such a focus on like perfection and like cleanness. And right. that's that's something where when people make the empirical statement that if it's perfect and clean mm. that is what is ideal that's just right. i just would like to offer up the counterpoint which is yeah that might be ideal for you but i think for a lot of other people myself included at it, I, I could not be more bored by that i could not find that less interesting at this point humanity's been around so long that it's like mm. well you're never going to be leonardo da vinci like you know we mm -hmm. kind of aren't been there done that we already had the people who perfectly now mm -hmm. i want to see the people who are getting messy and finding new mm -hmm. forms and new ways of expressing right. themselves right no 100 yeah. i mean i feel like everyone in the space like i've heard this term like, who's the next picasso you know who's the next yeah. van gogh and it's just like Ugh. well how who did you make picasso? a market you know, it, he was it, a it, womanizer it, and an asshole so <laughs> you know i kind of it's that of yeah. like ugh. Just even, yeah. <laughs> just like, look, as, as someone who knows plenty about art history, it's like, right, right? right, like, look at art history and what it lifts up, the values it lifts up. It's very, like, it's very male. It's very white supremacist. It's just all these right, things right, right. where I'm like, ugh, like, we don't, let's, can we not replicate that in the metaverse? I think that we see these conversa conversations happening all the time on Twitter. And like I said, it's something right. where I, I'm often hesitant to, to, to get into them partly because I I try to spend as little of my time as possible fighting with people on the internet and I have right. learned how the most innocuous of opinions can end up with people like trying to drop a nuclear bomb on you and telling everyone right. that you're a gargoyle because you you know how dare you have an opinion um, mm -hmm. but it's all to say like I just feel like, uh, you know, it's that we're all seeing, we, I mean, we see it. everyone, you know, there are sites popping up every day that are aggregating the numbers. We're all looking at the numbers and right. we're all going, oh shit. Well, why is crypto art mirroring all of the worst qualities of the IRL art market? All these things that at the beginning, we all had this utopian vision of this is going to make 
you know, this is going to open this up. We're going to have more women. We're going to have more people of color and more marginalized voices. And it's going to be amazing. And, you know, I could, we could dissect this so many different ways, but I think the reality is, well, look at who has the money. You can't tell people how to spend their money. A people buy what's their taste. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the bottom line is we still see that the people who have the money tend to reflect the same people who have the money in the real world or the IRL, you know, market. And, um, I don't know, it's just really tricky. It's like, it's something where I'm so glad we continue to have these conversations and I hope we all continue to fight to make this space more, more viable and more open, but I don't need more Picasso. Mm -hmm. Like he's done right, it's right. done like enough with yeah. picasso like mm-hmm. i don't know it's just like there's so much incredible art from pre-crypto art you know of of art mm-hmm. history that's been overlooked by women by mm-hmm. people of color by mm-hmm. i'm not even trying to make it an identity thing i'm just saying right, like right. there's so much out there that was so amazing that like mm-hmm. i don't know again i i'm just saying it's all it's all a matter of taste and and i'm, mm-hmm. I'm certainly not trying to um I'm not trying to undermine. I'm not. I'm not trying to throw shade at anyone who's working in right, the space. Right, right. You know, I really have respect for anyone who's who's working in mm-hmm. this space and is and is a nice person. You know, right. um, but it's just to say that, like, yeah, it's. I just feel. I guess I'm speaking up for those of us who I think are are plentiful, whose voices aren't right. heard enough because we are sensitive, like tender little little artists who are kind of like um, excuse me but also this is valid like excuse me my i think that this other way of doing things is valid and because we're not standing and like screaming at everyone that it needs to be this way it's very right. easy for these other voices to get overlooked and so i just when i have the opportunity i like to point out that it's like just because you see certain things making a ton of money in the space that's real you know and that and that's right. but but also recognize there are other approaches. There are other approaches to art. There are other approaches to what is interesting, what is exciting. I mean, I think we can all agree that just because something makes the most money doesn't mean it's like the the best culturally right. or artistically. It just means right. it was the best at figuring out how to make money. Um, so, <laughs> you know, obviously these are things I think about a lot, especially as mm-hmm. the space is just growing and growing and growing. Yeah, no, I think it's definitely points that need to be addressed in this space and that they're not spoken enough yet. But it's, you know, the thing is like, you know, the space is so new. And so hopefully, you know, in the future, more of these points are going to be brought up and discussed about as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I love to kind of understand, you know, like growing up, you know, in, in Ohio, like, you know, how did you get familiar with kind of analog videos and VHS? Because mm-hmm. like I saw a video that you posted on your blog and it was you as a kid reacting uh-huh. the first time that you fell in love with video feedback. I yeah. love to know that journey and how you got into VHS as yeah. well. Yeah. Oh man. It's so wild that that video exists. Like I, mm-hmm. I transferred all my family's old uh, home videos, maybe, maybe at 10 years ago and found right. that video. And it's just one of those things where I was like, this is crazy. This is like, mm-hmm. again, this would be like having video of the first time Mozart found sat at a piano. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, crazy to me that I have this footage that exists of like my dad showing me video feedback on the family camcorder you know plugging it into the tv and pointing the the camera at the tv and it's like video feedback has become such a huge part of what I do of how of of so many of the pieces I create um yeah I'd really say it's that you know it's that I grew up like my dad was very into like stereos and camcorders and cameras both my parents were into photography And, um, I think for me, it comes from the fact that like, as a, as a baby, really, like my dad was in medical school and he had to have a computer. And so this would have been like, you know, the late eighties when I was like really a baby. And, um, and they, my parents just made the decision. I probably just because of space, like, I don't even know that it was necessarily like for my benefit, they just were like, oh, we'll put the computer in Sarah's room. And, and, and it's that. So by the age of like two and a half, I was running programs on MS-DOS, you know, running floppy disks so I could play my little games on the computer. So I just, I am someone who is very fortunate to have become very technically literate uh, in a generation where I think there are a lot of people my age who are not like that, you know? Um, And, um, and I think it's what's allowed me to, to keep evolving, right? That it's just like I learned computer at the same time I learned language. 
And, um, and so that sort of continued on. I was always with the camcorder, you know, we were fortunate in that way that, that our family had a camcorder and my right. dad was often filming us. And I just, you know, Bugs Bunny style was like, I was always scheming as a kid of how I got to get my hands on that camcorder. Like I, I, have, I have another video that's even earlier than the feedback one of me at the age of like five. And my dad is trying, you know, he's filming my mom and my brother and, um, and I'm like a five-year-old in my little like bear nightgown. And I'm going, Hey, can I, can I see that camera? Hey, can, can I use that? I want to use that. And my dad's like, no. And I was like, well, you let me that one time. And he's like, <laughs> no, like, no, I'm not letting you have this. And, right. um, and I, you know, literally a five-year-old, like I'm a little Muppet baby. And I was like, oh, well, yes. I'm old enough, you know, <laughs> I, you know, I'm old enough. I know what to do. Like, and I was like, oh God, this just one of those, it's so weird to see a video right. of yourself as a child. And you're like, God, I just always was so me, wasn't I? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I just even at five, I just was so myself that I was like, I'm old enough. I know what to do. So she'd give me that right. camera. I have I have important films to make. And <laughs> and you know, as I was transferring this this home video footage, all these little all these little like uh interludes between, you know, things my parents had filmed, funny little things where it's I have one where it's like me that I'm filming that I like film the toilet and I was like, this is my favorite part of the house. Like it's all oh, these little God. like Sarah explains it all moments where I managed to get my hands on the camcorder. Because I also knew, you know, I'm I do not I I as much as I like to be experimental and push things, I also hate getting in trouble. Like I I, yeah. I was never I wasn't a bad kid, I guess is how I'd put it. I was very of getting yelled at so it's like the you can tell any, any of these pieces of footage that I'm like terrified I'm gonna get caught because I knew right, my dad right, right. would yell at me if I was using the camcorder without permission um that was just like a huge part of my childhood and then it even translated to uh like I said I went to an arts middle school and we and I say middle school it ran from the fourth to the eighth grade which is sort of unusual mm -hmm. it's like a magnet school that you had to try out to get into and we had this sort of thing in most of our classes where anytime we had a class project, if we wanted to, instead of writing an essay, like instead of writing a paper, mm -hmm. we were allowed to do a video. And right. I, so from the age of like eight on, I just have all these like video, I just did videos for every class project. And so I got really good at editing video, like in the camcorder, you know, cause it's like, I didn't have, I wasn't using a computer to edit. I was like splicing right. things together by like, by putting a VHS tape in the VCR and I would like, you know, find my scene that I'd filmed on the camcorder and I'd record it to the tape and then I'd stop and then I'd find something else and, you know, doing right. editing in the most rudimentary way. And, and then, yeah. And then as a teenager, I uh, got a job working at a video store. So it's just, all, it's just like, I mean, I've always loved film and that's, mm -hmm. again, I, I have these sort of two prongs of my own practice, right? I'm a video artist, but I'm also like, I'm a screenwriter. I, I, I'm, I'm very interested in film and entertainment and television. Um, so yeah, I worked at a video store uh, as a teenager, sort of the last, the last generation of teenage video store employees, right? Like by the time I worked at the video store, everything was DVDs. And so uh, we had just an epic number of VHS tapes and they rented for like 50 cents. Like, no, by then it was like so few people wanted that and pe new new things uh, weren't really coming out on VHS. So my manager kind of got a kick out of me, like let me put together my own collection. So I did like a foreign film collection. I did a collection that was like all of the weirdest things I could find. Like there was right. some VHS, there was some... Uh, I remember there was like the attack of the killer tomatoes and there was one that was like killer condoms. It was like, they were weird. These things were, oh we had some, some v videotapes at this store that were really weird. Um, but like, as I recently like, uh, benefited, I learned how to like fix broken VHS tapes, you know, how like VCRs yeah, right. will just chew them up sometimes. And mm -hmm. I learned that when I worked at the video store and I, I had a like heart attack <laughs> like a week ago because uh, my, I, you know, create all my work on VHS and right, right. Um, and something went wonky with my VCRs and it ate oh, my no. tape. And it was like oh, all the work I'd created since November, which like I have several mm -hmm. pieces on this tape that are like some of my some very high earning, important pieces of no. mine. Where like, you know, it's at this point I'm trying, I'm looking into like getting a safe, like a fireproof, weatherproof safe for my tapes. Cause I've realized now I'm like, these are actually, 
important archival objects, right? Like they right. have all the originals of my crypto art on them. And, um, mm -hmm. but I was very grateful. I was like, okay, let's dust off this skill and, and, and we can do this. And I, I'm happy to report I, I fixed this, uh, this tape. Um, well, that's good. so, so yeah, it's just for me, I don't know. It's just one of those things. It's just always appealed to me. And, um, and then, yeah, I was so into film photography for so long mm -hmm. and it just kind of gave, it's kind of just evolved into video around like right. 2011. Um, and, and I was doing primarily video, doing a lot of live video, like live visuals for bands and stuff right. around LA. And, um, and then, yeah, it was around 2015. I finally got my hands on that camcorder, that family camcorder. Oh, my yeah. parents finally oh, let me have it. And, uh, and a lot of the work, you know, I still use it. I'm creating those, these right. pieces I'm creating are with this camcorder that I've been scheming for, for mm -hmm. 25 years. Um, which is kind of fun. Um, yeah. So, so it's just, that's, that's been my journey. Wow, it was all leading up to this. It was a camera yes, corner. Right. It was a exactly. <laughs> exactly on the <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, I absolutely love it. I absolutely love it. Um, so again, Sarah, it's been amazing having you. You're an amazing interviewer, an interviewee, and and it was a pleasure having you. I hope everyone enjoyed this interview just as much as I did. But just as a final question to ask you, mm -hmm. what is some upcoming projects that you're working on that you could that you would like to share with us? Ooh. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. That's, you know, That's I always get asked that question and it's so tricky because mm -hmm. like, you know, with, I can't talk about most right. of them, you know, <laughs> like I can't, mm -hmm. like I have stuff. I keep, I keep cryptically on Twitter telling people, I'm like, right. I have big things coming. Like <laughs> you want, you want to invest in my stuff now because I have big <laughs> stuff coming and it's going to probably mm -hmm. change things. Um, right, right. It feels so like, I don't, I don't know, like, like a cartoon character, like I'm plotting over here, you know, mm -hmm. but um, I, I really do identify as a cartoon character. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, in some ways it's more of the same and it just in the sense right. of like, I've, I've cr been creating some stuff in my studio. That's like really right, right. cool, really exciting. Mm -hmm. Some really funny things. Um, yeah. I am leaning more into uh, you know, it's something I've done really the whole time I've been doing video art, but I, I'm also, you know, I'm a performer. I studied theater in college. Right. I, I think it might become apparent when people hear me talk of like, oh, she likes to put on a show. That's, you know, I'm called the Sarah show <laughs> for a reason. I came up with that screen name when I was like nine and I've stuck right. with it for a long time. Um, even though, you know, it's like, sounds like a screen name a nine-year-old would come up with, but um mm -hmm. It's all to say that like I'm leaning more into some like performance based pieces and right. um, you know stuff I'm filming in my studio as I like slowly lose my mind from COVID lockdown. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> why not document my encroaching insanity in a way oh that everyone can enjoy? Mm -hmm. um, so I have some stuff like that, and uh, you know, there's just a lot developing in the crypto art space right now that I you know mm -hmm. I've got my got my fingers in many pies you know I I, mm -hmm. I I get excited about trying new stuff so right um I, I obviously can't speak speak to any of that it's not my stuff mm -hmm. to reveal um right and like I said my my wife and I are, are developing a project right now that I can't go into depth about but mm -hmm. I'm like really it's it's been this funny thing of like splitting my time really between crypto art and like this whole other side of me which is like entertainment Sarah um right so just to say that, like, you know, if you're interested in what I do, just like give me a follow. I'm the Sarah show everywhere. And mm -hmm. just know that, like, there's some really there's some really cool stuff coming down the pike. And and I, I hope you will go on this on this ongoing journey with me. 100 percent. I think I think everyone here, you know, learned a lot from you today as well. Um, and I think we touched on some very important topics, uh, like I said, and I'm going to post all of your social media links um, in the stream text right now. So give, go give Sarah uh, a follow and go check out her auction as well on, uh, on Super Bear. Um, but yeah, thank you so much uh, for coming on. Um, it was a pleasure having you and have an amazing, amazing day. Thank you so much. This was a blast. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Take care. You too. See ya.